Uh, and to, to touch on what Josh is, you know, talking about, I, I hear from delegates while we're in the House and we're in session talking about that if we were to impose some type of locality pay housing index or some type of uh, uh, alteration to the pay for uh, growth areas, that it would incentivize the people that live in those areas to, to move to these areas to work. And, and I couldn't disagree with that more. I, I've had discussions with them and try to make them understand that, uh, you know, Berkeley, Berkeley County and Jefferson County do not compete with any other counties typically in the state. In West Virginia. In West Virginia, right. So we compete with, you know, Fairfax County, Loudoun County, Montgomery County, um, Frederick County, some of the richest counties in the, in the country. So there's a huge disconnect, and I don't know if I would call it a locality pay, but we definitely need to do something with uh, the housing index or the cost of living for homes. Uh, I would say that the cost of living, a, a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, and, you know, a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit from McDonald's, all that stuff is pretty close to same to price. But the difference is, is our housing cost, the real estate, and, and the property that it sets on. Uh, I was just doing a little research to, uh, last night, and a three-bedroom, two-bath house in Berkeley County rents for about $1,800 a month. Uh, I have some of rental properties myself, which are two bedroom, one bath, and they're 14, you know, between 12 and 14 hundred dollars a month. Um, some of the older ones are 900 to a thousand. So, the the you know the cost of living to to rent and to own a home and live in the Eastern Panhandle is substantially more. Um, there are some areas that we are just in a complete crisis mode. I went to a DOH meeting on th uh, Thursday, last Thursday. Berkeley County has 40 slots for DOH workers, and this is not including the interstate. This is just for our uh, our road systems in the county. I think there's 17 employees out there. I mean, so it's it's almost in a crisis mode. Uh, the same with our corrections officers, uh, which is uh, uh, across the state and also affecting uh, uh, other states too. But uh, we see it everywhere: CPS workers, DOH. Um, all of our state employees, we are just uh, state troopers. You know, we are we, we are severely undermanned in state troopers in the Eastern Pain Hill, which puts a lot more pressure on our sheriff's department. I think we have 67 or 68 deputies yeah. now. Um, I think there's only 16 state troopers that are working in Berkeley County right now. I think there's supposed to be around 30. So uh, these are some some serious issues that we need to address in the Eastern Panhandle. Matt? So I guess the question would be, without some sort of locality pay, without some sort of a housing index, and I'll leave this for, for both of you, um, both John or, or Josh, just how do you go about fixing it then? If, if it's not a locality pay, if it's not something to help bring a worker in the Eastern Panhandle up to where they can afford to live in the eastern panhandle how do you fix it well i think a lot of the work has already been done for us i mean if you look at the federal government the federal government recognizes people that work for the federal government that live in different areas get paid differently because like of the you're agency. talking military and, and, and fed, federal employees federal employees i mean a lot of the work if we we had a realm we actually had a discussion about this when we were in morgantown for our interims up there and uh, you know a lot of the work has already been done that shows uh, what areas of west virginia would require this uh locality pay or whatever, <laughs> well, really whatever you want to call yeah. it you can call it whatever you want okay. there just needs to be a di different distribution for people that live in areas where the cost of living is so much greater. And I, and I understand what, you know, Josh represents his people, his constituents, and he has to answer to his constituents. Josh is not an unfair gentleman. No. He's, he's very fair. But he answers to his constituents, and we answer to our constituents. And it seems like every year we're getting a little closer. We're getting a little closer. Uh, I was a little upset this year with some of the locality pay, some people that, you know, I have supported legislation throughout the state, throughout the state, um, economic development, um, throughout the whole state uh, for different projects and money sent to lots of different places. And, and I don't say, well, that's not good for the Eastern Panhandle, so I'm not voting for it. So I, I do get a little upset about that sometimes. Mr. Gostrap? You know, <clears throat> satisfaction in something like this is all about the disparity. And I understand that in um, other parts of, of the state where there's a sense that because somebody else is making more, I am then somehow making less. It's logically fallacious. It's just not true. But I understand how that's a feeling. The problem is 
that now that exact same situation exists here, but the alternative is to go out of state, which is only a half hour drive. So in, instead of, of worrying about upsetting intra-state teachers, you know, from one county to another, we're bleeding teachers into Fairfax, Montgomery, and Loudoun counties. Which means that everything that goes with that employment is going in, in that direction. It makes no sense to me whatsoever that the locality pay, as and, and pay is in everything. Uh, Josh talked about, Josh, you talked about corrections officers and such. There, there are a lot of barriers that are keeping people out of corrections. It's, it's not just, it's just not pay. But I think that pay is a big deal for teachers in particular, very necessary asset to any community, when the draw of out-of-state pay that gives nothing back to West Virginia is so close. Josh? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I, I understand the specific issue, um, and, and I really, have, you know, empathize with it, and I realize that there has to be changes made. Um, however, I'm just very concerned that, you know, that this could be a, you know, a big swing to morale for state workers in different parts of the state. And, you know, the legislation that we had before us last session um, specifically mentioned, you know, three areas of the state. Um, you know, maybe if we could look at, you know, setting some kind of criteria that wouldn't, you know, that, that would reach other parts of the state or, or whatever, um, maybe that would be more of a, um, maybe more of a compromise um, and, and seem more, you know, fair to state workers across the state um, that they could, you know, rationalize it. And like the gentleman just said before, um, you know, it, it, it might be logically fallacious, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, perception is everything. Right. Um, and if, yeah. if, 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 if workers feel that they're being, you know, treated unfairly compared to, you know, their equivalent elsewhere, then, then that causes some major issues. And that's, you know, that's, that's a big concern. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of places. We're seeing that with, uh, not only with state workers, but we're seeing that with, you know, EMS, fire, um, a lot of folks that when they feel disenfranchised or they feel like they're not being heard, that creates a much bigger problem. So, Josh, um, so that's, we, that's my major concern. Yeah, we were we were sitting chatting one day, and, and we, I was looking out the river um, outside the Capitol building. Those are the giant barges of coal coming down the river. And you had mentioned that a lot of those uh, those, those barges or those uh, that coal came from your county. How much coal does your county produce, or uh, how much severance tax do you create for West Virginia? So, so Boone County has dramatically decreased its coal production over the last decade, um, and that's that's mostly because it's, you know coal production has really decreased in, in a lot of areas across the state. Um, before, roughly about uh, a decade ago, we had 110 coal mines in Boone County with about 35,000 people in our county. Now we have around 20 to 21,000 people, and we have about 12 operational coal mines. So we've dramatically decreased over the last decade. Obviously, the last five years have really been, you know, um, you know, kind of up and down. But, um, you know, we've, we've dramatically increased there. But over the years, we've provided substantial, substantial, not just Boone County, but the whole entire region, Boone, Lincoln, Logan, Mingo, McDowell, um, has provided substantial amounts of coal severance tax to the state. And that's really what funded not only our area for, for decades, but, you know, the, the whole, the state as a whole. And, um, you know, I mean, I don't have any, any issue. I know, Mike, we've discussed over the time um, that we've been in the legislature about potentially using, you know, allowing us to keep some more of our coal severance tax and things like that. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't think we're in a bidding war here. I think we can all work together and, and really come up with a compromise that works for it works for everyone. I just think that we need to we need to really open up our minds to all possibilities and all negative impacts that could potentially stem from this. And I want to go from the public sector to the private sector because there always seems to be some kind of a a different standard set because clearly a plumber 
um, name the business in Boone County that provides a service to a community cannot charge and make the type of money in Boone County that that same person with that same skill set, with that same certificate, with that same education could make in Berkeley County because of the demand and the other elements that are on the market. So what makes the public sector so much different than that private sector that says, look, I, I know the job that you are in is in helping to fix roads, but helping to fix roads in Boone County and making a certain amount of money is a lot of money, whereas making that same amount of money in Berkeley County is not the same amount of money because of the expenses. Why is there, I just, I struggle sometimes with that disconnect between how the private sector works and how the public sector works. John? Well, yeah, I mean, to, to bring that, you know, into fold, I mean, you know, the private, the private sector is, 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 capital market driven i mean people will pay me competition it's competition but people will pay me for my service and the service i provide um and the standard of quality and and my reputation and and they'll pay what it costs to have things done in this area which is going to be substantially more than what it's going to be in do you, th do you think it is substantially more i do believe yeah, I'm the, the plumber would charge more in berkeley county than they would in i'm, in I'm sure there's, or, i'm or. sure there's just so much more demand up here mm -hmm. is the thing there's just you know i mean there's just so much demand. There's so many new homes. There's so right. many homes that are here. So many people to support. But um, there's also so much more competition. So you've got to compete with everybody else. There is, but I mean, the market, the market has market this wonderful it. way of balancing yeah. itself. It right. really does. I mean, I've been involved in the construction industry my entire life since I was a small child, and uh, the construction industry and and private industry just has this very unique way of balancing itself out for. Uh, supply and demand and when things get out of balance you you know when things are out of balance and I remember one time when we had the big economic downturn in 2008 someone asked me said what are you gonna do I said what do you mean what am I gonna do this is all I know I'm we're, gonna, houses. we're gonna figure it out yeah. you know but a lot of the guys who were riding that wave that crest those people are gone right uh, but the people who were are locked in and this is what they do they figure it out did you and, drop prices well, we dropped prices. We dropped employees. Yeah. I mean, it was a uh, it was a very it was a very scary time. You know, Josh, your thoughts? Go ahead. Sorry, John. Josh, do you think uh, it costs less for a plumber in Boone County than it would in Berkeley County? Oh yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree that there are substantial market differences. I mean, I think that's the case with anywhere that's. Where, where there's a, you know, uh, more urban population, it seems that there's, well, like you said, more competition, more expenses, prices are different. Of course, I accept that. Um, I think back to what the gentleman said earlier about what the difference between, you know, private and public is here. I think that that's generally accepted that in, you know, in, in a, a private market, you, there's, there's more competition, there's more movement, there's more, um, you know, competition of wages, competition of prices. Um, I think that's more generally accepted. But when you get with state workers, there's there's also a constitutional issue as well. And I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about as well, because it's uh, when, when you're when you're publicly funding things, it's not a it's not as laissez faire as as a private system. You know, you have to apply things with a standard. You have to apply things equally in most cases. Um, because you're affecting the general public, um, and I do think that that could be a that could, that's that's what makes a, a major difference between the public and private sector. Um, obviously, the private sector is is much more successful in almost every case, um, but in a lot of places, like in Boone County, we don't have a you know a private alternative to some things, um, and that's that's what makes the the public sector and the the employees that that. Um, that are employed there, keeping them, you know, happy and everything else. That's what makes it so so important. And Matt, I think there's a there's another difference. If I want to build a high quality house and I want to pay, I'm willing to pay a premium. I hired John. If I, not everybody wants there. 
people will tolerate less quality for less price. And, and that's a choice that you make. We can't tolerate that in state services, in education, in credentials officers, and all of that. So I think that's a fundamental difference between the two. Josh, how do, how do you feel about taking this back to the agencies? Uh, Senator Barrett had a bill that ran on the Senate side, and uh, we could not get it to run on the House side. We, the uh, locality pay bill, which I thought was very – the locality bill that we ran I didn't think was the best bill. Uh, there was a bill that came over from the Senate side that Senator Barrett and a few other senators had worked on, and it really took it back to the agencies, and it let the agencies kind of figure out, okay, this is what we need done, this is the people, this is how many people we need, and we're going to have to pay more for, you know, these uh, people within our own state agency to get this done in different areas. So it really put it back on the burdens for, of the of the secretaries and the commissioners of the different agencies. How, how do you feel about that? I think that would be a much better approach. Um, I think that that, you know, on face value, of course, I'd have to read more into it, but on face value, that seems like something I would be much more, you know, uh, able to accept than, than, than what we had last session on our side. Um, and I think, too, that when you think about that, that kind of allows the, the individual agencies to act as a, you know, as a, as a free market business, to make their own decisions, to decide, you know, here's our issue, here's what we need to fix, here's how we fix it, instead of, you know, a, uh, you know, a dictum or a mandate being put down by, by the legislature. Um, so I think that would be a, a much better approach and something I would be actually really interested in looking at. And I, th I think uh, when you look at it, there's a lot of positions that are unfilled throughout some of these uh, state agencies. They, they don't have the freedom to increase a pay. They've got 20 positions that are unfilled that they're not spending the money and they're getting the funding, but they can't increase the pay for XYZ position to ensure that they're staying with them, right? So this is why the agency getting some kind of freedom could be the way to go. Yeah, John. we see that in corrections. So, yeah. you know, at the Eastern Regional Jail, they are running at about 50% or maybe a little less than 50%. Yeah, it's like 46. 40, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then they have the National Guard in there that are kind of doing the no contact. They, right. they actually cannot have contact with the... We did a... Um, uh, fantastic tour. Fantastic tour. Mike Height and Eddie Gokenauer set that up, and yeah. we, we did a fantastic tour down there and got a lot of good information. But they're not allowed to use those excess positions to yeah. pay more. Now, they do, they do use some of that for overtime because there's lots, lots of overtime. And they do have positions that haven't been filled for years. Right, so, and you also have the grievance process. Yeah. So that happened in the DOH. When DOH tried to <clears throat> have uh, areas where, you know, say like a foreman two or an operator one or someone was paid a little more, then the grievances were filed. So I think the legislature may have to get involved uh, in the grievance procedure part of it to make sure if the agencies are able to control um, the rate of pay that they pay, uh, you know, maybe different in different parts of the state. But there, there will be grievance, per, uh, you know, grievances filed, and that will have to be addressed. Uh, but I think that uh, we are, are getting to the point here in the Eastern Panhandle where we are in a crisis. Um, and I know there's other parts of the state uh, that are in desperate need of, of workers, too. But when you start talking about public safety up here, we don't have the state troopers that we need. Uh, Commissioner Gokenauer was just in here and, and was talking about our fire and EMS and, and what we need uh, to provide for that. Um, you know, and, and, and also our uh, school resource officers. So there, there's definitely some shortfall and definitely we need to uh, work on trying to figure this very um, tough pro problem out. And it does seem like we are gaining a little ground in the house every year. We're, we're right. gaining a little bit, so we'll we'll see. How close is the vote? I think we were we were off by seven. seven. Yeah, and there was some people that I talked to afterwards. I, I, I even tried to vote for Josh. I was trying to hit his button, but <laughs> Josh Josh is like a linebacker. He he was protecting that pretty yeah, badly. I, so. I went out and worked the vote after that vote was taken. You know, tried just worked and just talked to a lot of people, just conversations. And, and was able to sway a few, um, just kind of making them understand about all of the things that I have voted for 
in the West Virginia House for, you know, for areas that, that, that affects nothing in the Eastern Panhandle because, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. We want, you know, if if I want Boone County to be as, as fruitful as it possibly can be, uh, not only for the people of Boone County, but also to take pressure off other counties. So, you know, when we work and pass legislation that helps Mason County and helps the Northern Panhandle and, you know, um, you know brings economic development and to, to different areas, that's great. We want to be able to provide jobs and a tax base for the entire state, but we also want to be able to look out for our area, too, and in the unique problems that the Eastern Panhandle and Berkeley County has. And I, I think we need to, as a legislator, also look at the unique problems that Boone County has, because we look a lot different. The Northern Panhandle, Eastern Panhandle, Southern West Virginia, and Charleston are four different countries, <laughs> if you if you will, when you when you drive through them. Uh, this is going to bring us to our first break. Um, Josh, we're going to go on break. You'll hear commercials. Um, and we will come back, and then you will have the first topic for the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, and we will kind of go around and do the round table there. Yeah, so one of the things that, that was heavily discussed last session um, in, our, in our legislative session was House Bill 3153, and that was uh, the volunteer fire department and EMS funding. Um, and I think this is something that, that John can really speak to as well, being the vice chair of finance. Um, but what this bill specifically did, it increased the policy insurance on casualty insurance, uh, property or home insurance, rather, uh, from the current 0.55% to 1% starting next year. And it, it divided those funds half to the uh, EMS fund and then the other half to um, uh, volunteer fire departments. And it would bring in roughly $12 million, maybe slightly more, of increased funding for, for volunteer fire departments and EMS services in the state, um, many of which are are you know, hanging on by a thread right now. So, um, you know, John, if you have any more insight to that on, on why that wasn't able to, to, to make it through this year or um, what maybe we're doing to, to uh, work on that for next year. Yeah, Josh, I was intimately involved in that piece of legislation, worked that legislation a lot. And uh, what it was going to do is actually going to take right now on that premium, it's 0.45. Uh, goes towards the fire departments and the EMS, and it was going to raise a 0. 5, uh, 0.55 to make it a full 1%. And that bill started out that uh, it was going to all come from your insurance policies on on your house for your uh, your fire damage and that type of stuff. And then there was an am amendment in it that changed it over that it was going to come from excess lottery. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that we should be taking excess. And that was an amendment on the floor, right? That was, a, that was a House amendment yeah. put in by Delegate Danny Lenville yeah. uh, to, to take that money from excess lottery. I don't believe excess lottery, um, you know, is, is there to fund seniors and, and education and school programs, and it was that's the way it was sold, and that's the way that it, it, it is to be divvied up. So I didn't think that was a very good way to fund that. I uh, was not interested in, in raising the insurance premiums. John, it, it, it went from the House over to the Senate as excess lottery, correct? Did, didn't it, we it, pass it? It bounced back and forth. Yeah. About four, and then it, it came back as the uh, increase in, in the insurance again. Well, that bill had everything in it to try to make it die. I yeah. mean, it was bouncing back and forth, and the Senate didn't want to kill it, and the House didn't want to kill it, and it was passing back and forth. So, long story short, when it came back to House Finance, um, I put an amendment in it that I worked with um, uh, Delegate Riley, uh, or, um, Clay Riley. Clay Riley. Okay. So I put an amendment in it, and it put some modifiers in it because I was concerned that you have counties like Berkeley County who is going to pay a very large portion of that tax because we have far more homes, and our homes are valued at a higher rate. And that money is, to me, is unfairly distributed. It is distributed per fire department. So not, I don't, not per capita? It's not per capita. It's not per um, uh, calls run or any of that type of stuff. It's, just, it's, it's distributed per fire hall. So, for instance, Mingo County has 17 fire halls. Understand that because they're a very rural county. There's, it's hard to get around, so they're going to have more fire halls. They're probably smaller than our fire halls. But Mingo County would get 17 times the money. Berkeley County has five volunteer fire departments. We would get five times the money. So my my 
it was fundamentally flawed because you have counties like ours that are larger counties, have more runs, more people, our equipment's beat on more, it's used more. We were going to pay an absorbent amount of that through our insurance premiums, but we weren't going to see the benefit for, from it. So I had put a, a amendment in that put some metrics in it. Also, we had counties that, that had no fire fees or no ambulance fees that we're going to, to receive this money. So that was one of the metrics that I put in. If your county doesn't have a, a fire fee or an ambulance fee, then you were going to get less money because it's it's the county's responsibility to have a little skin in the game. Right. You know, there, those counties, you had counties like Tucker County that had a fire fee and no one would pay it, so they just got rid of it. Well, I didn't think it's fair for Berkeley County to offset that because they wouldn't wouldn't do it. Now I understand Josh is concerned because in his area he has rural volunteer fire departments that are struggling. My concern was are they struggling be- because of finances or are they struggling because they just can't get people to volunteer in the firehouses and does the money really help that? So I'm not opposed to funding the volunteer fire departments and coming up with a way to do that, but it, to me it has to be equitable and it has to be fairly distributed and I like to call it eat what you kill. So, John, on, a, on a per firehouse basis, what kind of money are we talking about? Four, I think it was forty-eight thousand dollars. Well, forty-eight thousand dollars is. If we took that twelve million dollars that Josh is talking about mm-hmm. and we divided it up per the volunteer fire departments across the state, I think it was forty-eight thousand. So that doesn't even fund. I mean, that funds nothing. Josh, what, 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 your thoughts on this? On the forty-eight thousand yeah, so per. Yeah, I don't per. disagree. Right. So I don't disagree with what John just said about um, about the specific departments receiving receiving money and uh, you know not having more runs and not having the population. I, I, I see that point, and I'm willing to I'm willing to budge on that. But one thing he did say that I think is a little little inaccurate is about is was at the end of his statement there when he said does, does the finances are the finances really a problem? Well, we don't have a problem. In Boone County, with volunteers, we have a we have more volunteers, frankly, than that we need, um, than we need rather. Um, our problem is is funding. I mean, they barely have enough funding to get the emer- the equipment that they need for training. They barely have enough funding to do much of anything. I mean, a lot of our a lot of our little volunteer departments. I have eight in Boone County. Um, now we we had more in previous years, but they they've consolidated a few. Um, I don't think we could go without a single one of them um, because of how, you know, how long it takes to travel in many of these places. And, and we have, we have, I think the, the smallest um, fire department that we have is, is the uh, Morrisville fire department, which is just South of Charleston on the, on the Boone Lincoln, um, Boone Lincoln border there. And we have 15 or 16 volunteer fire, volunteer firemen, that are always on duty, and this serves a community of roughly, you know, 600, 700 people. Um, so it's, it's, we have plenty enough people um, that, are, that are volunteering. It, it, is a, it is a funding issue. And one of the things that we've been working on in the interims, too, is because uh, I'm on the Fire and EMS Committee for interims, is, um, you know, trying to make this, you know, not only equitable, like, like John said, for all the areas in the state so where we don't have people, you know, paying more at a disadvantaged rate, but, um, you know, also providing oversight through the treasurer's office and things like that and making sure that we're on the West Virginia state auditor's checkbook, um, for financial reporting and things like that. So, um, you know, that we have a working bill before us now, and I, I just, I'm curious to see how that's going to be, um, um, how that's going to play out next session. And that was another one of the modifiers that I put in, Josh. So the first modifier was if you had a fire and EMS uh, fee in your county, The uh, one of the other modifiers were if you were one of the six largest counties uh, by population. And then there was, uh, uh, we had also put a proviso in there that we didn't put it where you had to be on checkbook.gov because the auditor's office thought that might be a little too much for some of these smaller fire departments, but they were they were going to be audited by, they were going to have a legislative audit every four years, and then it would have a audit by the auditor's office every two years. So well, I we, think that we, checkbook.gov is a fantastic idea. I know that when that came back from the Senate, I was definitely in favor of it. But what, what will 
normal forty eight thousand dollars do per fire department? Well, uh, actually, I seems, just I just seems... ran I just ran the numbers. There's three hundred and ten volunteer fire departments okay. in West Virginia. Twelve million dollars divided by three hundred and ten is thirty about just a little over thirty eight thousand dollars per fire hall. Would, so, would that make a difference, Josh, in, in your county? Thirty eight thousand, forty thousand? Absolutely. I, I've I've had requests from my local uh, fire department, the largest one in my county, uh, which is the um, the Racine Volunteer Fire Department. I had a request the other day to try to find funding for fifteen thousand dollars of training equipment. Um, they've held hot dog, um, you know, hot dog sales. They've had bake sales. They've had, you know, volunteer uh, uh, fundraising events on the side of the road. They've done everything possible. They've done auctions, everything, trying to raise the the funds that they need. And like John said, I, I don't disagree. The counties have to have skin in the game. We have a fire levy here. But part of the problem with that is where it's based on property taxes and our lack of population and the loss of population over the last few years is their funding goes down every year, and it has for the last 10 years. So see, that's not a problem in some other areas where the population is, is steady or the population is growing. It could be a net benefit. But here in Boone County, we've seen our, our departments have gotten less and less and less with, with even more need because – the need is, has, has either stayed the same or increased because a lot of the folks that are moving are younger people. So there's, there's – and this is not so much on the fire departments as it is the EMS, but you have uh, mostly older folks that are staying in the county that are growing continually older that are more susceptible to you know, having some kind of health issue. So it seems so, to me that the answer would be to try and grow your base of population. I mean, it, 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 I know – you know. When you when you think about thirty eight thousand forty thousand, I know each legislator gets about twenty five thousand dollars in leader funding um, for economic development to stimulate growth. Um, each senator gets more than that, right, John? About one hundred and twenty thousand. What is LIDA? Uh Legislative economic development development assistance. It's actually local economic development assistance. Yeah. So. Um, it, it, every legislator gets to spend money within their uh, district or county or whatever on things that they feel are important. And I know John and I partnered up for the uh, the um, American Legion um, baseball, baseball field. field. Um, I, I've done stuff for the robotics in, in, in the schools and in you know, yeah. band and things like I, that. I just gave 10000 to... Um Bennington Volunteer Fire Department for some new Jaws of Jaws Life. Of life uh, yeah. we d I did some money for hospice and I did some dental stuff for the children's dental place out there. and It's, it's a good program. I have the solution. <laughs> and no, seriously. Establish a state fire and EMS fund where all this money goes and then the individual fire departments make an application for specific things out of that. That, that evens the, the playing field. And, well, then who decides, you, though? I'm sorry? Well, who decides where that money goes and how, how much? I'll, I'll do it. it. You'll do, do it. it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> what? No, but that, that's the second step. Yeah. But, if, but if the objection is an unfair distribution of state money, which is kind of the theme of the show today, uh, then the I would think the way to get rid of that is establish a fund that everyone has equal access to it. So if it's the Beddington Fire Department wants a new uh, first tool draws of life or want training equipment, whatever the case may be, it's just doled out that way. So now... Because what's going to happen, I would think, with $38,000, whatever it is, there are going to be some fire stations that are just going to sit on it, and it's going to become a new, you know, just a general fund, right? They don't actually need the money. They're not going to spend it. Others are going to be shortchanged because it's not nearly enough to pay for their needs. I don't know if anybody ever sit on it. This is, uh, I think but what, that's, must but be what large, inefficient bureaucracy would run that? Yeah. I'm telling I'll be really efficient. My fee is small. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a good idea, however... It will be an efficient bureaucracy okay. that it, it'll it, be it another amazes, department it, that that needs more money, needs more money, but never seems to get. Well, that. first it has to build a really nice headquarters building. Yeah. 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 It amazes me how the legislature in the last couple of years has become so ter <clears throat> territorial. So when I first got there in my first two years, uh, there was a large split between Republicans and Democrats. It was about 57 Republicans, and the fights were completely different fights. They were, you know... Uh, arguments, not fights. Yeah, arguments. Or, you know, yeah. the, the things that we were working on were, you know, some union stuff and some 
tax things and right to work. Right, yeah, and right size government and working within agencies to right size things. And in six year, five years, almost six years, it's it's went into where I feel like we have done a lot of work and we've done a lot of things, and now we're kind of in defense. We're running defense, and we're also trying. There's no low hanging fruit, so um, we are are really. Uh, kind of going after each other and it's become very territorial uh i passed a my magistrate bill was a very territorial bill because some areas were going to lose some magistrates and then and it, so it, it has become that way there's such a disconnect and a divide between uh the different areas of west virginia and and berkeley and jefferson and morgan county are very different than boone lincoln and logan and they have their challenges and we have our challenges um, but it's, it's really um, been amazing to me how that shift has happened in the legislature so quickly. All right, have the, the legislature has obviously become supermajority Republican, but are the arguments pretty much the same? Where the Democrats, when they had the, the areas with, and they were arguing their local issues, are the Republicans now arguing the same side of the same issues? For for their people, just the, poli- the the no, I don't po- think the arguments people. are the same. I think that there's um, there's two different. You know, there's right, there's there's the right, and then there's the far right, mm-hmm. um, and then there's a small section of moderates, and then there's a small section of you know you have pro business, and then you. I mean, there's so many different um, within that group of Republicans, and even you know before. Well, I think there's also uh, and Josh, you can speak to this. I think there's also a leadership versus non-leadership and there's there there is some there are some younger uh, republicans within that super majority that are super conservative or have forward thinking or think you thinking a little different to some of the older guys like us right josh well i mean i think part of that is there's a more there's a more growing populist wing of the party and i think you can see this from not only on the national level, but also on the state level, with a lot of the, a lot of the younger folks, especially as as Mike just indicated there, you know we have uh, nine, eight or nine folks under the age of thirty, um, many of which were just elected in the last, you know, uh, last election, um, and almost all of us agree on on, on fundamental issues. Um, and and some of that beyond, and that we're more of a uh, and and, and I'm, I'm saying this as a unofficial stance. Of course, we're not a caucus or anything like that. But the things the things that I want to focus on are are, are people oriented, very 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 socially conservative yet people oriented um, uh, policies for our state. And I think that I think what you have to really look at is um, a lot of these local issues have been a growing problem. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that we're facing here in, in the Southern coal field, it, it's been a growing problem. that's just a cumulative of, of years. It's not a Democrat or it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. Um, it's just a, it's a regional economic issue. And, um, you know, we have to, we have to go to bat for our districts sometimes. And that's what we all do. And, um, you know, we, we get very passionate about it. And I don't. I really don't think. I find myself oftentimes on the um, on the opposite side of John on a lot of these issues because of our regions, um, and because we represent such very different areas. But I, I really don't feel a lot of times that it's that it's animosity, especially from maybe it is from some, but not for not for myself or or, or several others that I had discussions with. I don't feel that it's animosity towards. Um, or jealousy towards anyone doing in any area doing better economically than the southern part of the state. I just feel that a lot of times our constituents feel that we're we're left without any, um, you know, without any benefit while the benefit goes to other parts of the state. So I think we just have to sometimes be a, a an aggressive voice and a watchdog for a lot of the people in our area, and I think that's what they expect of us. Um, and John said, you know, there's some, some farther to the right that are in the southern coal fields, and that's true. Um, some of these guys are very aggressive. That's yep. true. <laughs> and, and I will say that your constituents are much closer to you in Charleston. So um, there, there were a lot of times there were people on the floor after session pounding on Josh's desk right next to mine, you know, telling them 
him, I want this, this is what I want. They, they showed up. Um, whereas people from the Eastern Panhandle generally, unless, unless you're in a government role or a nonprofit role that's getting some kind of funding, we don't see a lot of our regular constituents down in Charleston telling us what to do. Would you agree with that, John? Yeah, we're, we're a bit more insulated and a bit more disconnected yeah. one, because of the distance and also people here, um, you know, they're so busy, you know, living their lives, traveling, right. working, you know, maybe going to Maryland or Virginia. I mean, if you think Jefferson County has 18,000 people a day right. that leave Jefferson County for work. So, yeah, we, we are a bit more insulated and there's a little bit more disconnection. And we don't get to introduce a lot of people in the galleries when you're right. from the Eastern Panhandle. So, and Josh, is, Josh does a very good job of representing his constituents. Josh is a very fair and measured young man, and I, I enjoy conversations with him. And he is true. We, we and him do not not fundamentally agree on a lot of stuff and it i think it has to do with the regions that we live live in there's an age disconnect you know i'm probably at least maybe 25 years older than, than josh josh um so and you know and i can i fancy myself more of a reagan republican i'm a i'm a fiscal conservative really concerned about the fiscal aspects of government and the social issues um just just turn my stomach i right. mean i just i don't i don't enjoy being i mean it's part of the job right. and you have to do it but i don't enjoy the social it's not the reason you want to no i i am a i want to be involved with the the beans and the bullets i want yeah. to be a bean counter and i want to make sure government's efficient and and we are right sized government and we are spending money where we should be spending money hey josh this is john gilstrap i'd like you to expound on something you talked about the in, within the populist wing the the, the younger folks that you're more people oriented. What does that mean? Yeah, I think that what that means is that corporations don't necessarily come first. Um, and what I mean by that is we can't sell our soul. <laughs> that, that's, that's what I mean by that. I, I think that it's very important to, to realize that we've got to have a, we've got to have a free market in almost all cases that we can. But we also have to realize that there, there's people behind the, the political ideology. There's people behind the economic policies that we have. And we've got, to, we've got to take a conservative approach to a lot of these things. We've got to realize, is it conservative to let, you know, to, to let corporations run over top of people? Is it conservative to allow, um, you know, allow folks to be completely um, destitute okay, in I certain areas of the state just for the just for the sake of economics. Put some meat on those bones. I mean, yeah, don't want to sell our soul. We don't want the, the corporations to give me an example. What kind of what's either as specific as, as you can get into where this is happening yet shouldn't? Sure. So I think that one of the greatest examples of that is is, is, with, is with trade and with um, pharmaceuticals. Um, so number one is we just had a, we recently had a, um, a a bill this past session we had a bill to cap insulin which is oftentimes seen as a as a very liberal uh, approach because you're capping something that's that, that's a free market uh, you know free market good and service um, see and, and all of the younger folks all of the people that I would consider in the populist wing voted for that and spoke in favor for that because. There's a, there's a there's a a weight and a balance in in a lot of our eyes that you know is is it is it, is it the conservative thing to do to watch people suffer to watch you know some some individuals suffer that don't have access to certain things when there's really going to be no economic benefit uh, or any economic deficit to uh, a business to cap insulin which is you know already free in a lot of other cases or, uh, you know, at, at a low cost to make. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the best examples and that's on the economic side of things. Um, and on some of the, the social conservative side of things, um, you know, we're, we're very conservative pro-life, you know, pro second amendment, any of the social issues where it seems like the culture is starting to fade away in a lot of things, you know, that's, that's where a lot of, you know, a lot of us, Younger folks and a lot of the people I consider populist are ready to step in and fight back against that. I think you got to push back a little bit uh, on your Josh on the on the corporate side of it. You, I think for us up here, we've seen some of this 
corporate, what it's done for us, the growth. It's grown our tax base. It's given us these problems that we, we complain about but are good problems to have. And I think some of those things would be beneficial down in southern West Virginia, which is why, and I think uh, to answer John's question, I think specifically uh, when Josh and I were, were totally opposites was, uh, was my form energy uh, uh, vote, I, I think I understood what that would do for where and what it would do for especially if it works out and it looks like it looks like they're going to get all kinds of federal funding so i'm even more proud of my vote now um but those are the things that we need to look forward to and, and that's the direction we need to go to grow west virginia to grow our base so that we don't have to raise taxes in the, in, in, in the and, long run and i would push back a little bit on josh too yeah. and you know if we were going to do a 310 million dollar economic development project in Boone County, let's say we were going to influx $310 million into a new coal company or some industry down there that Boone County has not been able to um, uh, exploit or been able to, to, to nail down. A new Volkswagen plant. Whatever. Yeah, whatever it is. Whatever yeah. it is, if we were going to do, you know, influx $310 million into Boone County and, and then let's say a portion of it had to be green energy, you know, or maybe there was some ownership in it that some people didn't like. Maybe, you know, someone that... Mike made, Hornby. You know, yeah, someone that had a 4% interest in it didn't yeah. like. I'm certain that Josh is going to vote for that economic development for his area because he knows it's going to grow the base. And I tell you, I took about as much of a butt whipping on that form energy vote than I did about anything that we did. And listen, I didn't agree with it 100 percent. But those those batteries, that, that technology is going to be built somewhere. And it might as well be built here in West Virginia and supply West Virginia jobs and and tax base and and that that project had a lot of capitalization in it i mean i read the mou and understood it very well and i think if josh had the opportunity to vote for some huge economic development program in his area he'd vote for it all right we're going to leave the last message to josh since he's our guest uh we response to that josh and then we're going to say goodbye to you and go to a break yeah mike well i, I really appreciate you having me and and what john said there John, I, I do think that I, I would be supportive, and in a lot of cases, I have been very supportive of economic development plans. And some of the some of the comments that were made regarding form energy, I don't, I didn't necessarily agree with, even though I voted against the the plan. The reason I voted against the plan was twofold: one, it's a startup company, and we're investing millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars into something that we we're we're very uncertain about what the benefit's going to be. And secondly, where their entire being, not just something that a that one individual has said or something that's in their uh, policy goals for the future um, or some kind of, you know, uh, green standard that they have for the future. But when their entire being and their entire purpose is the antithesis of what your entire state is, is, is what the people of your entire state not only believe, but what's been the fundamental building block of their economy for their entire for their entire existence i just think it's a slap in the face so that's that I, I don't think that we need to reward with state tax dollars corporations that want to wipe out ways of life for the people of the people of this state now i have i voted for the new core project i voted for uh the the project up on the panhandle that we had most recently um project i believe it was with was it with yeah that's with, it yeah, um I, I am all about I am all about um, playing the economic development game and doing what we've done. I think we've done a great job. And before I came along, I have always been supportive of what the legislature's done on the economic development front. I just think that we can't take every deal that's laid out in front of us, number one. And number two, we have to be very selective about what kind of things we are able and what, we, what kind of things we want to accept culturally not just economically because culture is the number one thing in my eyes just a I quick mean, that's, that, just, that comes first just a quick little rebuttal against that josh those batteries are energy storage they produce no energy zero energy they store energy produced by coal i'm gonna cut they store energy off by, ga by natural gas <laughs> so so i got a little these rebuttal are, in there these are the these are the arguments that we had as friends and i call josh a, f a friend because he is uh, we sat next to each other and when john's speaking on, on the floor and josh is next to me and we're whispering in john's ear as 
as he's speaking. These are the kind of things that we'll go back and forth. Uh, Josh, I really appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing you in interims, and we will maybe have you on uh, to, to resume this conversation another day. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And we're going to take our last break, and then we will uh, have a round table discussion just in studio. Yeah. So, at last hour, gave you a kind of a look into um, how the other legislators think. They're not all these crazy, horrible people that just hate panhandle pay or hate the panhandle. They, they they still represent the same amount of people, and they they've got a, just a different set of problems that they have to answer to. Yeah, and I didn't want that last segment to come off that you know me and yeah. Josh not liking each other. We me I mean, he's a fine young gentleman, and and we talk a lot and we disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens a lot in the legislature. I think it's supposed to be that way. I mean, me and you disagree yeah. sometimes. I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, people have their own thought processes. You put a hundred people in a room who think they're the smartest person in the room, and there's going to be a little controversy. <laughs> Your thoughts on that segment, Matt? I, it, I was very enjoyable. And, and again, okay. I, I think the thing that I appreciated is that you've got the differing views, but there's respect for one another. There's an opportunity to express those views, to iron out those views, to poke a little fun at one another and, and all of those elements. But hopefully in the end... Come and, and to I a think, conclusion. Yeah, I think with Josh, especially, and, and Mark Dean, he's maybe a little, little more salty around the edges. But uh, uh, I, I wish we could have got to hear from Mark. But w there's still a lot of respect. You could still have these conversations in our offices and get to some kind of working conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no fire throwing brimstone from those kind of guys that the, the, there are some of those people out there um but these guys keep it truly professional and, and we they try to get to a, a conclusion i think this is what cocktail parties and thanksgiving dinners should be everybody's taken to the mattresses now so they can't discuss issues yeah. in my family if if certain issues come up i'll be at my brother's house and he will get up and leave his own table because he doesn't want to have a, a discussion about something he no disagrees politics, with. No politics, no religion at the and, table, right? Well, but it's family. And yeah. we, we always grew up, I grew up through the Vietnam era, right? And, and so we were always shouting at each other at the table. It was always done with a lot of love. I think we need to have more of that in society right now where you can, people that you know are intelligent and whose opinions you otherwise respect hold a point of view that's totally different from your own maybe you should do a little bit of listening and see how they drew how they got to their conclusion you might not agree with it at the end but yeah, at least we, we don't have to agree we, right. don't have, we can still sit across the table from each other I, talk I, to each other i call those courageous conversations sometimes you just need to have courageous conversations with people talk about things that are uncomfortable i mean i've talked on this show many times you know me and my wife are conservative republicans i have one daughter who is a pretty liberal democrat and another daughter who's an independent more of a libertarian and we have very 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 robust conversations at our house, uh, talking about our differences. Uh, we listen to one another. Uh, we yell. We scream. We all love each other. But we have very, you know, tough conversations. Is it a generational difference between you and your, your kids? Uh, my kids aren't grown yet, so I, I don't know. But um, when did they become or how did they become? So my or? oldest so my oldest daughter spent six years at WVU and got her master's degree. You think and, okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, she's fresh out of like six years yeah. of a college campus and she's super smart. She's, I don't like to argue with her because she, <laughs> she's so smart. She will, my wife will say, just shut up while you're ahead. Um, and then my youngest daughter, she's always been a very free thinker, yeah. very, she's, she's really libertarian and very free thinking and uh, she's in her third year at uh, WVU which I don't think has been quite as influential influential on her uh, as my oldest daughter but we have these really tough conversations at our house and and I think I, I actually enjoy that my children are smart enough to have their own way of thinking and that and that will probably change throughout the years. I, I don't have the same political views and, and acumen that I had when I was 25 years old either. So That's very true. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, things change as, as being a business owner and, and, and going through life, your, your outlook changes. And this is the perniciousness of the, the woke mindset, for lack of a better term, on campuses as I understand them to be. There are you're shunned if you don't walk a certain line that you may or may not agree with, which then in an academic environment, that's where people are supposed to have these discussions. You know, the, the dorm room shouting matches at each other, which always ended still as friendships. 
those are formative. And if, if that goes away, then you just end up with this group think that yeah. I think foments a lot of the anger that we see. Quite do, we, do we have as much debate um, from both sides in our colleges that we used to? Or is that something I... I didn't go to college all yeah. the way through here. I, I think they're pretty one-sided. I yeah. think I think John's right. I think on the on the larger campuses, there's a certain rope, certain path to walk, and if you deviate from that path, you may find yourself on the you know maybe not in the in crowd or maybe not in getting invited to the certain party or, but I, you know I think that that's just different ages as you go through. I mean, I, you, your perspective of life changes as you age and as you have more. Um, uh, time to develop you know your personality and you know pe people change and their views change but, go ahead. i was just going to say but even as it changes we still tend to stick in that group right i watch this news channel not that news channel i read this newspaper not that newspaper because i'm feeding myself with what it is that i really want to hear as opposed to our conversation where you get it, both sides of the issue i just i find it, it it's it's crazy i, I am on the Fox News kind of more than I am there. But I, I, I will change the channel to NBC or, or, or MSNBC or CNN. They're take, talking about the same issue, but there's two totally different stories mm -hmm. there. And you kind of need to look in the middle. Um, but if every TV out there is saying one thing and the other, every 50% uh, of them are saying another, where do we sit as a society? Who do we believe? It's, it's like... I used to look at the news back in the day, and what those news anchors said was that mm -hmm. was just straight fact, right? Like the Walter Cronkite, mm -hmm. the, the older generation, it, they blatantly said what the news was. And I, I don't see that anymore. John? Well, no. And, you know, it's, <laughs> I, my politics are the right of center, and I'm of a certain age. And next month, well, not yet, in July, I'm going to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, which is, you don't get a more liberal university than that. I'm on the faculty of the Midwest Writers Conference. And I know, because it's happened before, I know that when I check in, I'm going to get a name tag. It'll say John Gilstrap, and I will have to check which pronoun I want. And I'm not yet sure how I'm going to handle that, because I'm of the generation of look at me. You know, if, if, I, if you have to ask, I'm doing something <laughs> wrong, right? So, and I don't, I, I don't want the conflict, but I also don't want to buy in to what I consider is just... A, Lunacy. You know, okay. <laughs> I, 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 there was a word in my head, but... Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I'm um, sorry. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. John? Well, there was one thing I wanted to touch on really quickly before we get out of here today. Yeah, we got 15 months. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, our Bureau of Senior Services is, you know, is a, uh, falls under DHHR, and it's one of our services that is lacking a little bit of funds right now. So I've been called Who by... Who are they funded by? They're funded through uh, DHHR. DHHR, and okay. there's a separate line item. A lot of their funding comes from excess lottery. Okay. That's what I was talking about. When we set up our lottery funds, uh, as some of the reasons to pass those lottery uh, was to fund education and Bureau of Senior Services. So it looks like we're going to have a little shortfall in their budget this year, and it's really starting to affect around September. It's going to start to affect the amount of seniors that we can feed. And these are... Have our seniors gone up that much? Are we yes. have that many so, more seniors? So I would... The information that I've received... Um, was that we've grown some of our feeding programs through the pandemic with CARES money and ARPA funds and such. So we've, they've grown some of their congregate meals, which is where the people come to the senior center and eat. And then also we have a meal, the, the senior centers have a meal delivery uh, system. And uh, so we're going to have a little shortfall in that. And I've been in contact with the governor's office, the Senate president, and a few others trying to get together to make sure that we can have some type of supplemental appropriation the next time we're in session. So if we're called into a special session or, um, you know, we, we are down there doing some type of appropriations, typically around the end of the summer, we have to start moving some money around. That's just what happens in the legislature. Um, some agencies may need some. So I've been in contact with the governor's office, been in contact with uh, my local uh, delegation from here in the Eastern Panhandle. And um, so I'm asking anyone that is concerned about this to reach out to the governor's office. How, what's the uh, what's the monetary shortfall that, that that they're talking about? I think we're about five million dollars short. So it's not just for Berkeley County. No, no, for the year. No, 
for, to okay. finish us out. To, okay, to finish, sorry. To finish us out. <laughs> yeah. And that's not just Berkeley County. That's, that's for all Bureau, That's for Bureau of Senior Services. Okay. So it's a, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. So um, uh, reach out to your local delegate, reach out to your local well, senator, and reach out to the governor's office and uh, be, be adamant about trying to get something on uh, our legislative session for a supplemental appropriation to be able to take care of our seniors. Do you think that, um, and this brings up, brings up a much bigger issue, that the, the ARPA funds, the COVID funding that, that, that everybody's gotten, right? All the different government agencies have gotten, the municipalities. Um, you look at the school system, they, they got it, they used it for counselors and things like that. All this money is drying up, right? It's starting to dry up for the next, and, and Congress just passed this, uh, this bill where they're clawing back some of this COVID money. Are we, did we create the problem ourselves by creating positions or, I mean, I, I just, I question whether we're $5 million over in the amount of seniors we have. I know we do have an aging population. I love the idea that, that, that you're coming up with, but are these government agencies all doing the same thing? thoughts well i would say that yes it's a lot of it self-inflicted i mean this was a huge influx from the federal government which i'm not a proponent of that i was not a proponent of all this you know money that was pumped into the economy from the federal government but also being a, a state representative yeah. it's our job if we have that money we're not just going to send it back we're going to spend it oh absolutely and, and it's our uh, within our purview to spend that money the absolute best way that we could. And I do believe that Bureau of Senior Services did grow a bit because of this influx of money. Uh, and now we're f probably feeding some seniors that we didn't f feed before. But it's one of those- Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing, yeah. you know, and, and, and I don't think this is a, is a uh, organization that has a lot of waste, fraud and abuse, and it's a very well-run organization. Uh, and I believe that they are just coming up against this shortfall, and I think the legislature, with the amount of excess revenues that we have, should be able to step in. If You know, I always say when we do things for children, we're paying it forward, and when we do things for the seniors, we're paying it back. And I think our seniors are one of our most vulnerable populations, and if the state can't come up with $5 million to continue this feeding program, I think. Yeah. The, so it seems appropriate. John? We've talked about a lot of things on the show today that all talk about not enough money to do the things that we want to do. Elephant in the room. We were sitting on a whole bunch of extra money. We called it a surplus. And then we justified that tax cuts based on that and sent the money back to the people. I don't disagree with any of that. However, it does beg the question, why didn't we spend that money on the stuff for which we now don't have enough cash? I think we do have enough cash. I think we still will have surpluses. I think even with this tax cut, I think we're going to see surpluses. And, and John can speak to this much better because he's on finance. But looking in, I still think there's a lot of surplus money on the back end of the budget, the, the appropriations side, the things like that. John? Yeah, I think I think we're fine financially. It's just it's divvying the money out. So we did a little over $900 million tax cut, bringing that money back to the taxpayers mm -hmm. through the personal income tax Um cut and then also being able to get the rebate for your personal property taxes. So I think those were all great things. I think that was it was time to start moving on that. We have a pathway to zero. I think that pathway will take us a little while to get there, but we at least have a pathway to zero. We're going to look at about probably $1.8 billion in surplus revenue at the end of the year uh, for, uh, you know, at the, at the end of our fiscal year. Uh, I think about $1.3 billion of that is already set aside and, and is spent, and a lot of that stuff we put in the back of the budget. So we do our spending in the front of the budget, you know, most of our agencies and such, and then the things that we will fund uh, with our excess revenue go in the back of the budget and they're funded in the order in which they are put in. Um, so we're, we're still going to be sitting on quite a surplus of revenue. And I think this is just one of this is a policy decision to look at those excess revenues that we're going to have to be able to put that money into Bureau of Senior Services. So I think it was it was time uh, that we start giving some of the money back to the people. I think the Republican-led legislature has done a very good job of right-sized government, making government work efficient, uh, working within it, within its means uh, with these flat budgets that we've run. And I think it was time to be able to give some money back to our uh, constituents. So, and I'm sure there's a naive question. However, for the whatever's left, $600 million, whatever, that's not accounted for. You divide that up by 55 counties, and we've got Eddie Gokenauer's uh, fire department, and we've got you know, the, the priorities of all the various counties. 
is that just impossibly naive to do? No, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, everybody's got great ideas. It's trying to come together and figure out which which are the best ones and which work best. I think there is some merit to, to what Eddie said this morning. I do. I, I do. I think there's something to be said for the way he's going about it. But there's also other things that need to be done that can help with our infrastructure. It's convincing or trying to lay out what the best way to get 51 other people to vote with you on to get it through. That, that, that's the thing. Because Eddie can you know, scream from the rooftops he wants a 1% sales tax, but if we can't get the other counties to agree, that even if you just said Berkeley County is the only one that can do it, we have to give them the ability first. And when you talk to legislators, when you give local control, they're going to take it, and, and that's going to end up in a tax increase for the, for the people. And, and, and a lot of legislatures don't want to be on record for raising taxes. It, well, it, in, in and it's always been my thought process. If we give if we give a entity the ability to tax, they will tax. I think that the, you know, and we're all for local control until we're not for local control. Right. Um, but I think that, uh, and, and like Mike said, you can't just give one county the ability to tax you. That's get unconstitutional. But I think the way that you have to look at it is it's maybe some tax shifting. You know, so someone like myself, I don't want to raise taxes on anyone, but I, I'm okay with maybe some tax shifting. I like consumer-based taxes. Um, most legislators do like consumer-based taxes because you give the taxpayer a little bit of ability in how they spend their taxes. You may want to drive a $70,000 car, and I may want to drive a $20,000 car. You may want to go out for lobster and steak, and I'm okay with a cheeseburger. So you really, you, you, and the things that are the fundamental things that we care about are not taxed anyway. So our food's not taxed, our prescriptions aren't taxed, professional services aren't taxed. So you're, you're, it's really you're making the decision on how you're going to spend your taxes. And I like the consumer part of it because three things, the consumer has some say in their tax spending, you capture the cash economy, which you don't through any of the other type taxes, and you also capture the pass-through economy, which is people that are traveling through the state of West Virginia, going to Myrtle Beach or going to, Vir you know, going to Virginia Beach or wherever. So you capture those things. So I like a consumer-based um, tax, and I think there's nothing wrong with that if we can shift that tax from someplace else. And I love the idea of putting it on the ballot for the people to decide. I, I think that's great on a you know, county by county kind of thing. We're going to be taking our last break.